Hi, you're listening to the Content Salt Podcast, the show all about how to create content to attract, convert, and keep your idle clients. Welcome to episode 246. I'm Susie Daphnis, and here with me is my co-host, Michelle Felton. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Hey, yeah, Susie. I am firing on all of my cylinders today. I'm really excited <laughs> to see you. As we record this, you're back from a big overseas trip and we're diving straight into podcast recording and it's just so great to have you back and get a little time to chat with you beforehand. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be back. You know, it's always good to go and it's good to come home. Yes. <laughs> and we just got back uh, actually just last night after over five weeks away. We had a fantastic time. And I always get a new perspective on my business when I take time away. And we did some incredible things over the last five weeks, including a physical challenge called 29029 Everesting, which is a climb where you scale Black Comb Mountain um, eight times. One time is enough for most people, but eight times uh, in a period of 36 hours. And doing that gets you the height of Everest, a little more actually. So it's an endurance hike. Um, it is like climbing Mount Everest, but in a totally different environment, of course, um, and a fantastic experience and something that I'd been working on and tracking my progress and my physical fitness and my food and my all my things for uh, months and months and months. So it was good to get that done. And then we truly, so I did it with uh, my partner, PJ. And uh, then we went to Portugal uh, for rest and recreation, ate a lot of wonderful fresh food. I know you've been to Portugal, Michelle, but the food, oh my gosh, I could not get enough. So good. Uh-huh. So good. And I'm enjoying just the history and the beauty of the country. And then we capped off the trip with uh, attending the mastermind that uh, we're a part of. And this time it took us to Austin, uh, Texas, where we spent three days with some smart entrepreneurs talking all things business and marketing. And while I've got a little jet lag this morning, my heart is happy and my mind is full and I have enthusiasm for the future. So it's a good day to be recording. <laughs> it is a good day. Can I just take a moment to congratulate you on that 29029 climb? Thank you. It just is such an amazing achievement. And having seen you do the prep work and, you know, it's very relevant, I think, for what we talk about here on the show, like having a goal and then mm. sort of putting a plan in place and then working the plan. And, you know, that's how we can achieve extraordinary things, even like climbing the equivalent of Mount Everest. So Mm -hmm. just huge congratulations to you. You inspired a lot of people with that. And I do love what you said there about getting a different perspective on your business when you travel. I find that too. And probably anyone that's listening may be nodding their head as well. And I'll be uh, heading off in a couple of days to attend my mastermind in the US. Mm. I'm also looking forward to that perspective into hanging out with really clever people doing good things. And so speaking of perspective, In a way, that's kind of what we're talking about today. It absolutely is because we're talking about a really important topic, something that's often overlooked um, as an area of business, and that is tracking the key numbers in your sales funnel. And it surprises me how often this is just overlooked um, because this is a perspective many people don't take. And so today's episode is all about encouraging you to know your funnel metrics. Now, even if you think, I'm not a numbers person, Susie, these are just five really important aspects of your sales funnel that Michelle and I are going to encourage you to get really clear on. And why is this crucial? Understanding the data behind your funnels really gives you a picture of your business that allows you to make important decisions and to do that with confidence. And knowing your funnel metrics can also make all the difference between consistently hitting your sales goals and the opposite, which is constantly feeling like you're falling short. And by tracking specific metrics, you can see clearly what's working, where potential customers are dropping off, and where you can make improvements that lead to more conversions, which is ultimately the goal in most cases. And so in today's episode, we're going to reveal five key numbers that every business should be tracking in their sales funnel. And these numbers are going to help you pinpoint exactly where to focus your energy to drive better results, to increase your conversions, and to grow your business. I love it. Mm -hmm. And before we dive into these specific numbers, let's just quickly define terms. We like to do that. Let's talk about what a sales funnel is. And really, in essence, your sales funnel is simply the series of steps leading to the sale. So at its core, a sales funnel represents the journey your potential customers go through from the moment they first hear about you or learn about your product or service to the point where they make a purchase and even beyond that. And I guarantee 
every single person in business has a sales funnel. Even if mm. you're listening to this and thinking, not <laughs> me. <laughs> if you sell something, you have a sales funnel. Now, that doesn't mean it's awesome. That doesn't mean it's been deliberately designed. It might be kind of happening by default. Mm. But you definitely have some kind of series of steps that lead to the sale, even if they are a little random, and even if they simply involve you you know, greeting people who walk into your store if you have a brick and mortar store and then chatting to them about the product and answering their questions and then walking them to the counter to take their credit card details. That's still a sales funnel. Mm. It's still a sales process. So there are many different types of funnels from the simple series of steps that I just mentioned all the way through to really highly sophisticated, complex, automated online funnels, moving people through multiple pathways and offering upsells and cross-sells. And maybe you've been in one of those funnels before. Maybe you have one of those funnels. So just know whether you sell a high ticket or a low ticket product, whether you are into high tech automated funnels or low tech conversational selling, this episode has been designed with you in mind and focusing on your metrics. These universal metrics, regardless of what kind of funnel you have, will make a massive difference for you. Mm. And like Michelle said, while there are many different types of funnels, there is a universal journey that most people take through any funnel. And you may have heard us talk about this in previous episodes if you're a regular listener. And this universal journey starts with awareness. It's where potential customers are just discovering you. They're just finding out that you even exist. Then they move into the consideration stage where they're learning more about what you offer and how it might solve their problem. At this stage, they might be thinking, hey, this could be what I'm looking for. And then there's the conversion stage where they actually decide to buy. And even beyond that, your sales funnel needs to take into account two additional stages. The loyalty stage where you keep your customers and get them buying from you again and again. And the advocacy stage where those loyal customers become raving fans and refer their friends and spread the word about you and your service. Now, these levels are all part of the buyer's journey, and they're really important stages for you to understand. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, understanding those stages really does help you to make a better funnel. But here's the thing. Not everyone who enters your funnel will make it to that conversion point of buying from you. People will drop off at, at the awareness stage or the consideration stage. Mm. And maybe they buy from you once. But they don't become loyal customers buying from you again, or maybe they stay loyal customers, but they never shift into that raving fan mode where they become your advocates. And if you're not tracking key metrics in these stages, you'll have really no idea where or why that's happening. Why are people falling out of your funnel? It's really like running blind and having this information, sorry, not having this information makes business so much harder. It can lead to things like a lot of lost opportunities, some major inefficiencies in your marketing, in your sales efforts. You know, you're working too hard for the money. Mm. And worst of all, wasted marketing spend. You definitely do not want to be paying for traffic if your funnel metrics are not where they need to be. It really can be a fast track to losing money. In contrast, those who know the numbers, they know the numbers to track and they've put a system in place to not only capture those numbers, but to regularly look at those numbers and really analyze them. They tend to have more successful funnels on the main. Mm, absolutely. So let's look at these five numbers for you to track in your sales funnel. And what we want to do is we want to start with the first key number that we recommend. And that number is conversion rate by stage. Now, what does this mean? Like we said earlier, there are some key stages in your sales funnel, awareness, consideration, conversion, loyalty, and advocacy. So tracking your conversion rate at each stage shows you exactly where prospects are dropping off. So for example, at the awareness stage of your funnel, you might be sending people to a landing page to opt in for a free download, a free guide. So you want to track the conversion rate of that opt-in page or the web page, if that's what you're using. What I mean is, do you know how many of the people who land on that page actually go through and give you their email address or book that appointment or opt in for your lead magnet? Like knowing specifically what that number is. 
So that's at the awareness stage. At the consideration stage, so let's say you offer a free webinar, you want to track how many people who opt in for your lead magnet then go on to opt in for your webinar. So if you can imagine you're offering a lead magnet and then on the next page you're saying, great, your lead magnet is on its way. In the meantime, I have this great webinar. How many of the people who opt in for your lead magnet then go on to do the next thing that's going to move them closer to a sale? And then once they've registered for the webinar, how many actually show up to the webinar? Okay, that's all in consideration. And that leads to the conversion part of the funnel where you're actually making the offer on the webinar or on the call where you're actually inviting people to buy from you. At that point, your conversion metric is the number of people who buy from you compared to those who show up and attend your webinar or your call and don't buy. Yeah, and it's no accident that this is the first metric we recommend, you know, Mm. like even if you only did one thing that we say today, right. do this one, mm-hmm. right? Just know what is happening at every single one of those key steps in your funnel. So, you know, if you haven't drawn your funnel out, think about drawing it out and, you know, just as little boxes and think about each of those steps. And I like to look at each of the main steps in the funnel and know what the conversion rate is of each of those steps. What that does is it gives me a really clear picture of what's actually going on. Think of it like um like water pipes going into your kitchen sink. Now, if you um, are not getting water out of the sink, you're not getting the results you want out of your funnel, where is the leak in that pipe system? You want to be able to go back and find that. Oh, look, they're all falling out of the funnel at this point, or it's actually just incrementally losing people along the way. So you want a really clear picture of what's actually going on inside of your funnel, how people are moving through it, versus just knowing that you put X number of people into the start of the funnel and you get Y number popping out the end to buy from you. Mm -hmm. And here's the really important tip. And Susie, I know we give this advice all the time. (laughs) And that is you want to think of these metrics that we're talking about. Susie was just giving you some great examples there, how many people that came to your webinar registration page actually signed up for the webinar. You want to think about these metrics as percentages as well as numbers. So let me give you an example. Let's say you get 40 people showing up to your webinar. Let's say there's a webinar in your funnel. You don't have to have a webinar in your funnel, but in this example, my my imaginary funnel has a Mm -hmm. webinar, 40 people have turned up. And on that webinar, I make my offer because I'm in consideration stage. I'm, I'm giving myself this great platform to explain what it is I'm offering. I make my offer and four of those 40 people buy my offer. Yes, it's four sales. And we have people say this to us all the time. Oh, my launch went pretty well. I got 30 sales. But you really want to think of that number in relation to how many people were on the webinar. Or if you're thinking mm. about how many people are um, landing on your um, opt-in page for your lead magnet versus how many people actually opted in for your lead magnet. That's your conversion metric. So in the example I just gave, four sales from 40 people on the webinar means you had a 10% conversion rate on your webinar. You see, I've taken it and turned it into percentages. Now, why do we do this? I think this is just like the magic secret key to unlocking numbers in your funnel because it gives you a much better picture of what's happening over time. So focusing just on the actual unit number of sales, like I got four sales, can sometimes skew the picture of what's going on in your funnel. So for example, let's say next time you run that same webinar, you get 80 people to attend and you make six sales. Now, if you're just tracking sales as a number of sales, that feels like a win, right? You went from four sales last time to six sales this time. That's great. But if you do the percentages for both webinars, the second one actually didn't do as well as the first one, even though you had a higher sales volume. And that's because you had more people on the webinar, right? The first webinar was four sales from 40 people. That's 10% conversion. The second webinar was six sales from 80 people. 
that's a 7.5% conversion. So conversion rate went down. Mm. Now, the actual volume is important. I would rather six sales instead of four sales any day. So you want to know the actual number. But knowing that my conversion rate on the webinar went down on that second webinar is very, very useful information. What did I change when I'm reviewing this? Did I do something with the lead source? Like, did I get more leads from cold traffic? Like, did I buy more leads? Was it that I um, made a mistake with the marketing and I changed the messaging and it didn't land as well? Did I tinker with the webinar and change something that maybe affected my results? Did I try targeting a different ideal client with my ads? Did I tweak my offer, like change out a bonus or something and it didn't go as well? Did I forget to mention my money back guarantee? Mm. I can get immediate feedback on those changes and sort of understand, decode what happened. Why didn't it perform as well? And that is the key to making your funnel better and better. Mm. I do love uh, what you said there and the tracking both numbers. So we don't want to be disillusioned about what we're doing. This is really about you having to be clearer as a business owner on what's going on in your marketing. And um, yes, we recommend you track both the actual number and the percentage conversion at each stage of your funnel. So a good way to think about it is like this. At the awareness stage, your conversion rate tells you how well you are doing at turning people who don't know you into leads. And at the consideration stage where people are deciding, are you the right solution for them? Your conversion rate tells you how well you're converting your leads into opportunities. And then at the conversion rate, when you're actually making your offer, you're looking at how many opportunities become paying clients, paying customers. Now, what conversion rate should you have? Healthy conversion rates vary depending on your industry. But as a general rule, if you're seeing a massive drop off from the number of people who click on your ads or your emails to those who opt into your funnel, you could have an issue with your messaging or who you're targeting. But if you see a big drop from your leads to opportunities, it could mean your lead nurturing isn't effective or what you're offering at the point where you're getting the lead and what the opportunities are a mismatch. But just say, for example, you get 100 people to sign up for your webinar or challenge and then only 10 show up. That's a big drop off from leads to opportunities that you will want to do something about. And if you're losing people from opportunity to sale, so you've got them there on the webinar, you've got them there on the sales call, you've got them there in your store, but they're not buying, it could be a sign that your offer isn't compelling enough or that you're not dealing with the objections that people have to buying your thing. So now you know which part of the funnel to focus on just by reviewing those three stages. You might need to target a more specific person. So perhaps your ads were going very broad, they were too general. Or maybe you need a better ad design or a stronger call to action, or maybe it's the opt-in page that's not compelling and really the messaging isn't getting people to do what you want them to do and so on. And many of the episodes here on the Content Cell Show, right, and this is episode number 246, they are all a resource for you. And we've done episodes on all those topics that we just mentioned. We do, we do. There's a running joke inside our mastermind. mastermind. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> there's a podcast for that, right? Because Susie and I say it all the time. They'll be asking about something. We go, oh, there's a podcast for that. <laughs> and so, yeah, there really is a podcast for all of those things. So I love what you're saying there, Susie, about the, the metrics giving you clues as to where to look. And it's the conversion metrics at each stage of the funnel that really can save you from feeling like you have to do everything all at mm-hmm. once, all the time, like that movie, you know, everything, uh, everywhere, all at once, or what was, I forget what it was called. I think that's what it was called. <laughs> kind of that kind of idea, right? Because it really can feel overwhelming when you've created your sales funnel. Like we were just talking about, there's opt-in pages, there's, did they sign up for the webinar? Did they come to the webinar? Did they buy on the webinar? Like, and then, okay, they didn't come to the webinar. Well, now I've got to mm. buy 10 different things to get them to come to the webinar. So it's sort of like a rabbit hole. And 
there really are a million things that you could focus on or tinker with in your funnel, but you don't want to do that unless your metrics are shining a light on an issue. And your metrics will help you shine a light on where the biggest issues are so you can prioritize what you're working on. Mm. So that's the first metric. So how are you converting people from one stage of your funnel to the next stage in your funnel? Now, let's have a look at the second number to track in your funnel. And that's your, that's number two, it's number number two, and it is lead acquisition cost or the cost per lead. So you should have heard of the words cost per lead. How much is it costing me to acquire a lead? And cost per lead is often abbreviated as CPL. So you may hear us refer to it here today as CPL or cost per lead. Now, this number tells you exactly how much you're spending to acquire each new lead. And it's a critical metric for understanding if your paid marketing efforts are actually cost effective. Um, So what do I mean by your paid marketing efforts? So this could be advertising on platforms like Meta, which operates Facebook and Instagram. It could be LinkedIn. It could be YouTube. It could be Google ads. But it can also be things like paid electronic direct mail, where you might pay an organization like a magazine or a strategic alliance to email their email list to promote your offer. Or it's any lead source, source of a lead, where you are paying money for that lead. So you want to have a way to track your leads by the lead source, where are they coming from, wherever possible, so that you can tell the cost per lead of various different sources of leads. Does that make sense? So you want to track where your leads are coming from so that you can determine if what you paid to obtain that lead makes sense and if that was a good lead based on then what they went on to do. So to calculate your cost per lead, you simply divide your total marketing spend by the number of leads generated. So for example, let's say you spend $10,000 on Facebook ads and from that you generate 500 leads, your cost per lead is $20. Susie, I can hear the questions now. Like, <laughs> the cost per lead. <laughs> $20? <laughs> And it's really not something we can define for you in terms of a specific number. Like there's no magic. This is what you should be paying for ads. Like Susie just said, there's many different places you can be buying the ads. It really does depend on so many factors. Like we've got some people in our marketing success mastermind with a cost per lead, a CPL of $3 because they're in a mass market like, say, crochet education. And we have others who pay $30 a lead or even more for a more business-oriented or investment-type lead. And you could even be prepared to pay like $300 for a lead if you know that you can get a return on that lead. And that's really kind of leading us into our next metric. Right. And that is metric number three, um, which is return on ad spend. So the return on your ad spent, and I'll explain that a little more in a minute, but you might hear the word ROAS. It's just an acronym. It's not an acronym. It's initialization of the words return on ad spend, ROAS. So if you're um, sending any kind, it is an acronym. I'll take that back. Um, if so you're, funny. I was just thinking, oh, I've got to rethink what an acronym is. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it is, I thought you're probably tw- turning at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for resolving that. <laughs> so if you're sending any kind of paid advertising to your sales funnel, this is a number, the ROAS, return on ad spend, is a number you absolutely want to keep an eye on because your ROAS measures how much revenue you've generated for every dollar you've spent on ads. And it's the ultimate indicator of whether your ad campaigns and your funnel are truly paying off. Now, we're going to say more about this, but for now, to calculate ROAS, you want to use this formula. It's the revenue generated from ads divided by the ad spent, how much you spent on those ads. So, for example, if you spent $1,000 driving traffic to your funnel, and then you generated $5,000 in sales from that funnel, specifically from ads, then your ROAS, your return on ad spend, would be five to one or $5 for every $1 spent. Can you see how knowing that is very helpful? 
Mm. I was just starting to think about, well, look, if I could put $1 into Facebook and get $5 out, mm. Mm. So, well, let me, how many dollars can I find to put in and get the, you know, the quality of lead that's going to give me a $5 return for every dollar I spend? So what is a good ROAS? Well, again, I'm sorry, we can't tell you exactly. <laughs> it varies by industry. It varies by oh. business model. Um, you might even find a different ROAS by lead source. So Susie was talking before about <clears throat> like maybe you've doing some advertising on LinkedIn, you're doing some advertising on Facebook, you might have a ROAS of, you know, $3 for every dollar you spend on Facebook and a ROAS of, you know, $10 for every dollar you spend on LinkedIn because that's where your people are hanging out and they're more receptive to your message there or, you know, it can vary. So as a general rule, and I'm kind of loath to sort of even give you any kind of indication, but I just want to kind of mm. land you on a planet here. Um, a, a ROAS or a return on ad spend of three to one is consider, considered be solid. Like that means you're earning $3 for every dollar you spend on ads. That's pretty awesome. However, in some industries with higher profit margins, like you sell digital products instead of physical products, you might get um, a ROAS of five to one or, or higher is even possible. But on the other hand, businesses with lower margins, mm -hmm. they might aim for a ROAS closer to two to one. So in some cases, you could even be aiming for a ROAS of one. That is, if you spent $1,000 on ads and you got $1,000 on sale in sales, you've kind of got back out what you put into it. Now, why would a ROAS of one or for every dollar I put in, I get $1 back out in sales? Why would that be acceptable? Why would we want that? Well, if your sales funnel is the first sale in a series of sales, you know, and we've often got multiple products in our product suite. So if it's the first sale in a series of sales, you might be okay with that first funnel being a break-even funnel. That is, you break even. You put $1,000 in to buy ads, you get $1,000 in sales. So if you decide to sell a low-cost $47 product and it costs you $47 to get enough leads where somebody buys one of your products and they give you $47, you've really made no money. You've just mm. broken even. And you certainly can't run a successful business with just that one funnel. But if you offer those $47 buyers another product by adding them to another funnel in a timely manner, you might find you get a high percentage of them buying your $5,000 product. And also there's all those people who didn't initially buy the $47 product who are now on your list. You've got a second chance to invite them to buy something else from you down the line. So even though the first funnel is break even, your ROAS initially is one, you effectively got some great in profile buyers kind of like for free that you can then send into your $5,000 funnel at a high conversion rate because they've already worked with you and they're, you know, they're already prepared to spend money to learn the thing that you're teaching. So that could lead to a ROAS from both funnels of two to one or three to one or more. So can you see how that's working when you start to string different funnels together? In this case, that first funnel is what's referred to as a self-liquidating funnel. That is, it covers the cost of acquiring that customer. And we've got a great interview in a previous mm. episode, Susie, with someone I know that you're really good friends with, Brandy Moles, on self-liquidating offers. And we will put a link to that episode in the show notes for you. If your ears have kind of pricked up as we talked about that and you want to know more about how those funnels work. Mm, very good. And that's a great interview with Brandy as well. And so if your ROAS, your return on ad spend is lower than you'd like, there are ways to improve it. But if you're not measuring this at all, then it's really hard to know whether you have an issue or not. And if your ROAS is too low, you could start by analysing the performance of individual campaigns. Are certain ad types working better than others? Are certain platforms, that is Instagram versus LinkedIn versus whatever else, performing better than others. And you can also try optimizing your ad creative. So the visuals, whether you're using still images or video or GIFs or whatever you're using, could they be more compelling? Could you be experimenting with different targeting strategies or refining your landing pages or your audiences to convert more of the traffic that your ads are bringing in? And you can look at those conversion metrics at each step of the funnel for places where people are dropping off and work on optimizing your funnel. 
Now remember, ROAS, return on ad spend, isn't just about making more revenue. It's about making sure that your ad spend, every dollar that you put in advertising is delivering real profitable growth for your business, either right now because you've got a high ROAS or down the line because you've already developed the next part of the funnel that's going to allow you to monetize the investment you have already make. So we are making great progress. This episode promises you five numbers to track for sales funnel success. And already we've covered number one, conversion rate by stage in the buyer's journey. Number two, your lead acquisition cost or your cost per lead. And number three, your return on ad spend, which is often referred to as ROAS. So let's now move on to a key metric that helps you understand the long-term value of your customers. This is one of my favorite numbers, Michelle. Uh, and that really is. I love it. <laughs> and that number is the customer lifetime value or LTV, lifetime value of your customer. What does that even mean? This is an important metric because it shows you how much revenue a customer is likely to bring to your business over the entire course of their relationship with you. Now, this is, I believe, one of the most underutilized pieces of information when deciding how much to spend to acquire a client in the first place. So this is more of a meta metric. I don't mean meta the platform. I mean the meta as in above metric. When you're looking at the value of your customer over the range of sales funnels you have and the potential total value of your business over time, For each person who buys you, this becomes very important. It gives you a big picture view of where any one single new customer can go rather than thinking, right, really myopically in short term Mm -hmm. as you bring in new customers. Yeah, I I really want to pick up on that point. Like, why is LTV important? Well, knowing this number helps you make smarter decisions about how much to invest in acquiring and retaining customers. You know, we often get a distorted view. Like I've had people say to me, oh, you know, um, I'm really upset about my uh, cost to acquire this customer. I had this conversation with a client the other day and they were going to stop buying ads. And I'm like, well, can I please have a look at your numbers? And um, very quickly after people buy this initial thing that isn't that profitable, they're buying another thing, which is really high ticket and really profitable. And then a year later, they tend to buy another thing. And then they tend to stay in that Mm. program for three years. And Mm. actually the lifetime value, the LTV of that customer is in the sort of $70,000, $80,000 mark. And they're kind kind of grumbling about spending a fair amount at the front end, but nowhere near that, like a tiny fraction of that. So it's a great way for you to understand really what makes sense to acquire that customer right now. So if you know a customer is going to be worth, say, $2,000 to your business over time, you can justify spending more upfront to acquire acquire and nurture that relationship. On the other hand, if your LTV is lower, you'll need to keep those acquisition and retention costs in check to stay profitable. And you want to know this number. You want to start to figure out this number. Now, maybe you're starting to see now how each of these metrics kind of work together and give you the full picture so you can make better decisions and create better results. So, you know, conversion rates kind of are lending themselves to understanding a bit more about your ROAS and how to change that. Your ROAS is sort of starting to help you think about your LTV and they all combine to give you this more full picture of your funnel. So when it comes to calculating LTV, your life time value, you want to look at the purchases someone is likely to make over the period of time that you can retain that customer. Now, you might have these stats right on hand. Other times you might be sort of thinking, oh, I I need to figure out how to capture that information. That's fine. So for example, if you have a business like our masterminder, Loretta Brandolini, who offers this beautiful line of skincare and hair care products for women over 50 uh, via her Illuminate beauty brand, You can figure out the average purchase value and how frequently someone purchases and how long they're likely to stay a customer simply by looking at your order history if you've been in business for a while. So let's say, hypothetically, and this is not Loretta's situation at all, I'm just giving us a bit of a hypothetical example, but let's say that Loretta knows the average purchase price of her orders is $100. Now, that's a a number we could figure out. And the average customer 
when she looks at her stats, makes about six purchases a year as they replenish their shampoo and their conditioner. So maybe it lasts me a couple of months. And let's say she's determined the average customer stays loyal to her brand for about three years. So if I discover Illuminate Beauty, I try their hair care products, I'm likely to buy six times a year for three years before I maybe change brands. Now it's just a simple calculation to work out the actual dollar value, the actual dollar lifetime value of her customer. So it's $100, that's the average sale, times by six sales per year, that's how often they would buy from her per year, times by three years as a customer. So it's the average sale times the number of sales per year times the length of time in years that that person will be a customer. Mm. So in this example, that's an LTV of $1,800. And what's really important about what Michelle is saying there is that sometimes I see business owners get really focused on getting in new clients rather than thinking about, well, how do I increase the lifetime value of my customers? So because that's, that's where the profit is. That's where the viability is. So you can't really make your business viable unless you think about what that lifetime value is. Now, if you sell mortgages, you might think, well, you know, someone buys a mortgage and they're not going to buy another one. Yes, but maybe they will. Maybe the lifetime is much longer. Maybe they buy another house in 10 years or 15 years or the value becomes, it, it's looking at it a little different. But for most of us, you want to consider this number. How do you increase the lifetime value? Like this is a number that's really important in our business. And history you know, having a little bit of experience in business gives you that. Because if you're just starting out, you don't necessarily know what the lifetime value is. But most of the people listening here, if you're members of the Her Business community, uh, you've been in business for a while. You didn't just come out the gate. And so you have enough history to know that, you know what, if I really take care of my customers, they're going to come back again and again. They're going to advocate for me. They're going to refer me. They're going to come back and buy. So here's a few strategies uh, that you can use just right at the top of our head, to think about increasing the lifetime value. So one is offering upsells and cross-sells. So that means encouraging customers to buy more or add complementary products to their purchases. Now, this is really um, relevant, obviously, if you're an e-commerce store owner. And we have probably all been that person who went to buy one thing and suddenly we've got five things in our shopping cart because we've been recommended uh, not other me. things. No, not you. Not you <laughs> buying an extra pair of shoes. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so, for example, and Michelle was using the example of the wonderful Loretta Brandolini from Reluminate uh, earlier, she could increase her lifetime value by incentivizing people to buy an additional product each time they buy from her. So, for example, if someone is regularly buying her shampoo and conditioner for a total of hundred dollars, then could she encouraging them? Could she encourage them to also add a hair treatment or a face moisturizer to their cart and do that right there in that process? Or maybe if you sell an online course, maybe you need to consider offering a high-ticket mastermind or group coaching program or one-on-one -on -one service to those customers to increase the lifetime value of your customers. Or if you have a membership, like we do, you know that you know the better that you are at retaining your members, the greater the lifetime value. And we'll talk about this a little more. So for us, we know that... Um, joining us inside the Her Business community. Most people join us at the level of becoming a Her Business Network member. But we know that women, we just, we'll talk more about that, but we're just so focused on this lifetime value and giving, letting women be with us for the lifetime of their business in some cases, you know, to be a part of their journey. But this means having real attention to this, giving people ways to up level to our mastermind program or to come to our growth retreat or to take on mentoring or coaching all the different services that we might have offered another way to increase the lifetime value is through having some sort of loyalty program so actually rewarding customers for repeat business by giving them some sort of incentive and i'm definitely one of those people i have stayed with brands for years and years and years and increased the lifetime value that i have to them because it's like you know what i spend another 20 dollars i'm going to get a few more points i'm going to be able to redeem those or whatever it is now increasing your lifetime value doesn't just boost your revenue it also makes your business more resilient 
more sustainable and less dependent on constantly acquiring new customers, which can be expensive and exhausting when you've already got customers there that you could um, expand the lifetime value of. So this is a really important metric. This is metric number four, a really important metric for you to focus on knowing your number, knowing your lifetime value. Yeah, and not only knowing the number and growing that number with all those great ideas you just shared there, Susie, but also I think it's, you know, what we started today's show with, like this idea of perspective. Oftentimes we're thinking very short term with our clients and not realizing the value of that customer to us over time. And in some situations, not all, we're kind of being very timid with our acquisition strategies or what we're prepared to pay to get a client. But if we could get that perspective, where we know, hey, you know what? We're going to make X dollars from this client in a very short period of time. It's beyond that very first transaction. Then maybe I will spend a little more to get them. Maybe I will invest in a proper graphic designer to do my ads. Maybe I will put a bit more into my social media or whatever it is. So really understanding that lifetime value is is absolutely key. I couldn't agree with you more. And for anybody that's listening to this uh, saying, well, maybe I am a newbie in business. I don't have that background knowledge that um, Susie was talking about. Um, Your aim is to put yourself in the best position to be learning this number and gathering the relevant data to do that. And to start with, you may be doing a bit of a guesstimate. Well, look, if I can get people to have an average sale of $100 and if I can get them to buy five times a year from me and I can get them to stay for three years, like what might that look like? And then you can start to run some water through those pipes and actually see yeah, that's stacking up. Or no, I was way overestimating how regularly they'll buy from me or how long I can keep them. Or I'm not getting them as long as I want. What am I going to do to keep them longer? I'm going to do a loyalty program or dip into some of those other great ideas that Susie shared. And one of the other exercises that I like to do with women is to look at the product service mix and look at where are the opportunities um, for people to work more closely with you at a higher price point or do something that increases that lifetime value. And we've seen this, Michelle, inside of the mastermind where women have come into the mastermind having one core product or service and then developing complementary products and services that allow them to now increase their revenue and make a more sustainable business by looking at that product service mix and introducing new relevant products and services that someone might want when they reach a certain stage of competency with what you're already teaching them. So top of my head example, uh, the wonderful Fiona Kiri from Style Liberation offered styling classes, colour classes for many, many years. Now, someone might get their colours done and would they need to get them done again? Perhaps, you know, if they changed their hair colour or they reached a different season in their life or something happened. But generally, you know, it might be a one-off sale. But she's developed this beautiful product and service mix where she um, offers complementary products and services that allow those customers to not just start with Fiona, but to years later still be using her services, different services perhaps than they came in on. So that's also something to think about. What do I want people to buy first and what do I want people to buy next? And while we won't go into that in this episode, because we really want to focus on these numbers, we just wanted to make the case for this fourth number, which is this lifetime value. Anything you want to say about that, Michelle? Oh, this is the game changer. Like this is about working smarter, not harder. You know, everything you've said, I just couldn't agree with more. And we we get the privilege of seeing this firsthand, mm. you know, like seeing what Fiona's been able to do with her business. And she's got, you know, a family that she's supporting and she's got some really big goals. And this is how she's getting there. Mm. It's not just constantly selling lots and lots of little something, some things that you'd sort of break your mm. over trying to acquire a thousand new customers for. How could you not make life so hard? What if it was easy? What if those handful of customers could be incredibly lucrative for you? If you could double, triple the lifetime value, which is totally possible just by being a little bit smarter. Susie, I was just um, talking to somebody the other day and um, they do they get clients into a $47 um, like a three-day event and they mm-hmm. sell a $25,000 program off the back of it. Yeah. So, you mm. know, just selling a $47 event, they're never going to get rich. No. But selling that big program off the back of it is a game changer versus selling a mm. $500 something or a mm. $1,000 something. So finding the product mix 
that works for you, finding that sort of um, stepping stones of pricing and all of those things, that's not something that immediately works itself out. You often right. need support. That's what we do in the mastermind all day, every mm. day. You know? mm. and, and you need to find good people in your life who can support you with that because this mm. is this is the guts of running a successful business right here. Mm. So good. So that brings us to our fifth and final sales funnel number, and that is Number five is your churn rate. What does that mean? So this measures the percentage of customers who stop doing business with you over a given period. So your churn rate is critical because even if you're great at acquiring new customers, if you lose them at a high rate, you're going to really struggle to grow. And a high churn rate, whether you're a naturopath and people come in and do services, you're a massage therapist, you're a business coach, you have membership, whatever it is, that high churn rate, people, you know, this revolving door of people coming and going, it can really damage your profitability because you end up spending more on acquisition to replace those lost customers. And your the lower your churn rate, the better your business will perform long term. So, for example, in my business, in her business, one of the core offers that we have is the Her Business Network membership. And as I said earlier, when it comes to memberships, retention is so important because if people are leaving as quickly as you're acquiring them, if you're losing people and not filling those places, then your cash flow is going to be all over the place. One of our company's strategic objectives, it's the same objective every year, is around retention. And our strategic objective is to maintain a retention rate of over 96% average all year. Now, most years we are at about 97, but some months we're as high as 98. We look at those numbers every single month because it's important. It's something that we track every single month so that we never lose sight of where we're at. And so we know where we might need to make a correction. Because it doesn't matter how good you are at selling, if you can't keep your ideal clients, one, it's a, a great recipe for burnout, and two, it reduces the viability, the sustainability of your business. Preach it, Susie. This is <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, and so there you have it. These are our five recommended numbers to track in your sales funnel. Of course, there are many other fun numbers you can track, funnel numbers you can track. Um, but if you were going to pick five, like these would be the ones that we'd recommend you you focus on. And you've probably noticed they're all a bit interdependent. They tell different parts of the story and you want to be consistently revisiting these metrics. It's not something that just gathers dust. You want to be using these as real tools in your business. And as a quick recap, number one is what's your conversion rate by each stage in your funnel? What's happening at step one, step two, step three, step four in your funnel? Number two is your lead acquisition cost or your cost per lead, which is usually abbreviated to CPL. Then there's your return on ad spend, often referred to as your ROAS. How much are you making for every dollar you put into ad spend? What sort of dollar value of sales are you getting back? And then there's your customer lifetime value or your LTV, lifetime value. And finally, number four, five is your churn rate. How quickly are you losing customers? How often are they falling back out of your system and not repeat buying from you? Mm. So I hope that we've inspired you to focus on some of these metrics if you're not already focused on them. Uh, and there's one other point I want to cover. And this, uh, I guess it's an invisible but really powerful benefit that comes when you know your numbers. And it has to do with the relationship between your funnel metrics and the emotions that you have about your progress, your business, and even yourself, how you feel about yourself and the way that you see your abilities as a business owner. So let me back up a little bit. So Susan Bradley was a guest speaker at our last um, two-day mastermind in the gorgeous Hobart, Tasmania. Uh, we Zoomed her in, actually. She's a dear friend of mine. We're part of the same mastermind. She's an amazing businesswoman. And she's got a business called Social Sales Girls, which focuses on helping a large community of women with e-commerce stores grow their businesses. And she shared every single step of one of her funnels with our masterminders. Now, during that presentation, she very generously showed us all her numbers. She showed us a spreadsheet that outlined her top-line funnel metrics. The numbers she focuses on 
to make important decisions about her business, you know, where she should put her energy, where she should spend more on ads, what parts are working, what parts are not. She also uses these metrics, which she tracks to test whether something's working or not. She's improving things. And in the case of the funnel that she was sharing with us, she showed how she's been testing various things to get her funnel to the point it is now. And that point is where she feels like she can put now some serious dollars behind paid traffic to the funnel because she's got the confidence because she's been testing. And in addition to sharing her percentages and the numbers she tracks, she also said something really important about her metrics. And I was so glad she shared this with our masterminders. And it's something that relates to her emotions. And she said this, this is an exact quote, tracking the numbers takes the emotion out of my marketing. Instead, I see anything that's not working simply as a problem to solve. And I love that. Knowing the numbers to track and then focusing on those numbers really can take the emotions out of things and help you stay focused on what really matters. Looking at what is the problem that is here for me to solve rather than turning, you know, to the fetal position when things aren't working the way you want them to or beating yourself up or thinking that everything is, you know, has gone to the dogs, nothing's working. So yes. it was such a wonderful reality check. And I think it's really a, a great thing piece of advice uh, for all of us to separate our emotions from what is actually happening in our sales funnels. I I 100% agree with you and Susan on this. And again, it kind of comes back to that idea we began with uh, sort of spontaneously today about perspective. It gives you a, a perspective on your business and on what's happening in your funnel. And we can lose perspective when we think, oh, it's all gone terrible. And I see people say that to me and then I look at their numbers and I go, no, it's actually pretty great. So um, when you're tracking your metrics, when you're understanding the beats of your funnel and how those beats in your funnel, those steps and stages in your funnel are performing, it really does take all the emotion out of it. It makes it very clear where it's working, where it's not working. And then you can go, oh, I've just got to work on my webinar. or I've got to work on my opt-in page. Or, oh, the leads I'm getting from that new lead source are terrible. I've got to find a different lead source. Because it's really true what you were saying, Susie, we can get very demor- demoralized when we put all this work into something and it doesn't immediately work. And newsflash, funnels don't always immediately work. And what I've witnessed in myself, although I really try and work on this and in people that we serve in our mastermind and clients and my peers and other people that I know, is we can tend to make up a story about what it means when our funnel isn't performing before we've really dug into the numbers. And that story may not be true. And often that story has some sort of element in it, some thread in it that we're just not any good at what we're doing. It's like confirming what we believed. Like we're just not good at this. We don't know what we're doing. We're not as good as everybody else. We're the special snowflakes that this doesn't work for. And we just make our mind up about these things and it kind of closes the door on the growth and the potential and the opportunity. So actually when you can get the metrics in black and white on the page or in your spreadsheet, it's just very clear. That's working. That's not working. This is how much that's not working by. And you can also see and become more present to that incremental improvement, Mm. which is so motivating because the big challenge is we can think something's not working. We can think we're not making any progress when it is working and we are making progress if only we were looking at the right metrics. Hmm. So important. Now, when it comes to how do you improve those metrics, <laughs> we've mentioned a few things on today's show, but there's um, that's there's a whole lot more. So, but we actually, you know, we could dive into every single one of those and go deeper, and you know, just keep listening. Right. We explore these things all the time on the show, but we actually happen to have an episode that you could check out right now if you wanted more help on this topic. And that is episode 216, Easy Steps for Optimizing Your Online Sales Process. We're going to add the link to that episode along with uh, any other episode links that we think would be useful. Anything else we've mentioned, we're going to put that in today's show notes. So stay tuned. In a moment, I'm going to tell you where you can find that. But first, I want to say thank you so much for listening, Michelle, and I love doing this program for you. And we love to share these tips with business owners. So I'm going to ask you a favor from the two of us. And that is, would you take a moment 
to leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. We are blessed to have over 100 five-star reviews. Um, So if you enjoyed today's episode, we would love it if you would leave us a rating. Um, One of the people we had on our show recently actually has left us a review, and that is the wonderful Kathy Farah. She um, is passionate about helping small business owners unlock the power of their email list by increasing engagement and revenue um, for every subscriber. Now, people loved her episode and wrote to tell us so, but then she actually went on to be a listener and she has left us a review. Now, a little bit more about Kathy because after interviewing her, I've signed up to her email list and you definitely want to do that. <clears throat> she is offering such great tips regularly. Excuse me, Michelle. <coughs> and everybody, I like cough into my hand. Uh, so uh she said in her review uh, a must listen for actionable strategies the content sales podcast does an incredible job of breaking down complex marketing strategies into practical easy to implement tips that truly work after i listen to an episode my mind is buzzing with new ideas highly recommend so thank you one kathy thank you for being on the show we're going to put a link uh to that episode i think michelle Yeah, we thought, you know, it was such a goodie and she's talking about why your promotional emails aren't working and what to do about it. It is an an absolute must-listen episode. It's episode 239, so it's not that far back. And it's a great episode if you're doing email marketing, which we highly recommend you do, because it's still one of the most effective marketing channels. So check that out. We'll put that in today's show notes as well. So thank you again, Kathy, for the review. Thank you if you decide to go on and um, leave us a rating or review. It's so important because it helps us get the word out and gets more women getting the support that we are trying to offer through this free resource that we've created. So um, anything we mentioned here on the show can be found in today's show notes, which you'll find at herbusiness.com forward slash five numbers. Now that's the number five numbers or one word. Michelle, tell us what we've got coming up in the next episode. We're going to be talking about how to plan out a launch. And there are some very definite steps in a launch, some of them that um, might be fairly obvious to you, but I would hazard a guess a couple that might you might not be so aware of, and they are steps that make a huge difference to how successful your launch is. So whether you're launching right now, you're doing product launches of any kind of description, or whether you've been curious about, hey, what's this whole launching thing, you definitely want to check out our next episode. Awesome. That's coming up two weeks from now. We want to thank you so much for listening. Michelle, is there anything you want to say before we go? Oh, it's so good to have you back, Susie. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time right here on the Content Sales Podcast. Bye for now.